Our first reading today is a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad because of her. All you who love her, exult, exult with her. All you who are mourning over her, oh, that you may suck fully of the milk of her comfort, that you may drink deeply with delight from the abundance of her glory. For thus says the Lord, lo, I will spread prosperity over Jerusalem like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing torrent. As nurslings, you shall be carried in her arms and caressed in her lap. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. In Jerusalem, you shall find your comfort. When you see this, your heart shall rejoice and your bodies flourish like the grass. The Lord's power shall be known to God's servants. The word of God. Today's psalm is from Psalm 66. The psalm response is, let all the earth cry out to God with joy. Let all the earth cry out to God with joy. Shout joyfully to God, all the earth. Sing praise to the glory of God's name. Proclaim God's glorious praise. Say to God, how tremendous are your deeds. Let all the earth cry out to God with joy. Let all the earth worship and sing praise to you. Sing praise to your name. Come and see the works of God. God's deeds on our behalf are marvelous. Let all the earth be dealt with God with joy. God has changed the sea into dry land. Through the river they passed on foot. Therefore, let us rejoice in the Lord. God rules with might forever. Let all the earth cry out to God with joy. Hear now, all you who fear God, while I declare what God has done for me. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer or stopped loving me. Let all the earth cry out to God with joy. The second reading is a reading from the letter of Paul to the Galatians. Brothers and sisters, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It means nothing whether one, brother, one bothers with the externals of religion or not. All that matters is that one is created anew. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule and to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one make troubles for me, for I bear the marks of Jesus on my body. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. The word of God. May God be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, the Lord appointed 72 others, whom he sent ahead of him in pairs, to every town and place he intended to visit. He said to them, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I'm sending you like lambs among the wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Into whatever house you enter, say first, peace to this house. If a child of peace lives there, your peace will rest on that person. If not, it will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from one house to another. Whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure their sick, and say, the reign of God is at hand for you. Whatever town you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the dust of your town that clings to our feet 
Even that we shake off against you. Yet know this, the reign of God is at hand. The 72 returned rejoicing and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us because of your name. Jesus said, I have observed Satan fall like lightning from the sky. Behold, I have given you the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and the full force of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice because the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. It would be really hard to stand up here wearing Reverend Myra's shoes. <laughs> I can't pull them off on solid ground. <laughs> so a few years ago, there was a wonderful grassroots art movement happening around town here in Rochester. You might have seen it. These wonderful mural painting projects started popping up. They popped up on broken down walls and on the sides of buildings downtown, just everywhere. And the idea behind this was a professional artist would design the mural. Uh, they'd sort of do an outline. And then it was up to the community to come out and fill out the picture, to color everything in and to decide what the final look was really going to be. So the end result was totally dependent on people showing up and the community coming together from all over the, the city to collectively paint together. So there could be a temptation of, for people of faith, maybe not so many of us in this room, but there can be a temptation for people of faith to say, well, God has a plan for the world. It's not up to me. Whatever happens will happen, and there's nothing that I need to do. Maybe there's nothing I even can do except sit back and wait. But whether the kingdom of God comes into this world depends a great deal on whether we show up, as we know. So more than saying, God has a plan, I like the saying, God has a dream. God has sketched a wonderful possibility for the world. God has traced an outline for us of what could be. But whether that dream comes to fulfillment and how much, how the picture gets filled in and when and how, much of that is, is up to us or so I believe. We're called to be co-creators, fellow laborers for the harvest. In today's gospel, Luke says Jesus summoned 72 people. So oddly specific number there that should catch our attention. It's meant to. There's almost always a significance when a number is mentioned in the Bible. This one is meant to make us think back to Moses in the book of Numbers. That's one other time when 72 people are called together and the context for that is Moses is feeling overburdened by his mission, and he asks God, God, please send me some helpers. I can't do this all myself. I need collaborators to carry out your work. It's too much for just me. So this is our clue here. Jesus is saying that he too needs co-workers. In his movement, there isn't to be any standing around waiting for God to fix the world and take care of everything alone. Even the Messiah needs fellow laborers, people who will join with him in bringing about God's kingdom. So Jesus says, I'm sending you. This is one of the rare times you're going ahead of me. You're ready. You have everything you need. Then he adds, I'm sending you like lambs among the wolves. And when I read through this gospel this year, that was the line that really stayed in my heart. With the repeal of Roe versus Wade, with the rolling back of environmental protections, with constant efforts that make it harder to cast a ballot and easier to carry a gun, we are moving through a hostile landscape right now. We feel like lambs among the wolves, don't we? But Jesus isn't worried because even people who are a little bit scared, a little bit vulnerable, have the power to cast out demons, to cast out the sources of harm, and to bring down the powers of evil, to watch them fall like lightning from the sky. That's how he puts it. Luckily, Jesus gives some instructions to the 72 and to us on how to bring his spirit to a world that isn't always receptive. So first, he says, make sure you communicate who you are. Everybody is afraid right now. 
So make sure the first thing you say to people you meet is peace. Peace to this house, peace to you. In Jesus' time, there was another group called the Zealots, that was actually their name, who wanted to change things around with violence. And Jesus was probably reacting to them with his instructions here. He was wanting to differentiate his followers from those folks. He says, my people are nonviolent. If they proclaim anything other than peace, that isn't my crowd. And it's still important for us as followers of Jesus to signal who we are like this. So much harm has been done by the church. So much discrimination and violence have been done by people claiming to be Jesus followers that it's still important for us to do this, to say right off the bat that we're people of peace and people of solidarity, which is why we march in the Pride Parade. It's why we have an interfaith mass. It's why we fight for racial justice. It's why we show up in support of science and women's rights and gun control to say that Jesus' followers are people of peace. Jesus gives some additional counsel to us on how to travel through the world. First, he says that we should hold out hope for our neighbors. We should have faith in the people around us, the people we cross paths with just through our everyday interactions. We should believe that any one of them could be hospitable. A child of peace is what the gospel says. Jesus would have us not expect the worst. The other day, I stopped in at a little restaurant down the street from me in my neighborhood. I know the owner there. And whenever there's hardly anyone else in the restaurant, she hangs out at my table and she'll tell me her troubles. Often, it's quite a long list. She feels sometimes like everyone she meets is rude and selfish and inconsiderate. She worries the world is falling apart. Too much greed, too much corruption, too many weapons. Politics depresses her. Watching the news depresses her. I see a lot of heads nodding. I have days when I feel just like that. So last week, after this long litany, all of this culminated in a speech from her about the conclusion that she had drawn from all this, which was that people are bad, no one is any good, and if the very restaurant we were sitting in were to be broken into and the cash register plundered and she herself left unconscious on the floor, that not one single person would care. Her neighbors were just all these apathetic college kids who annoyed her by playing their music too loud, especially the one across the street. Right then the phone rang. She walked over to answer it, and I noticed that immediately her voice got calmer and quieter as she talked to whoever was on the phone. After a minute or two, she hung up, came back to my table, and she had a little smile on her face. She said, that was my neighbor, the obnoxious kid who plays the music too loud. He saw the lights were on over here, and he knows it's getting late, so he wanted to make sure I was okay and that we hadn't been robbed and the cash register plundered and me knocked unconscious to the floor. We can't lose our faith in humanity. Every person we meet could be a child of peace, so hold out hope for everyone. Jesus also says, greet no one along the way. Well, what does this really mean? This isn't, of course, a literal instruction to not talk to people. He's telling us to focus, focus on what's important, and not have our attention divided by distractions. We don't have to watch every news story in order to be informed good people. We don't have to engage every argument. We don't always have to take the bait. We don't have to surrender to worry every minute. The Buddhists talk about dog's mind versus lion's mind. So imagine a dog is sitting in a clearing and his master throws a stick. The dog's going to chase the stick. Doesn't matter the size of the stick. Doesn't matter the kind of stick. He's going to chase it no matter what. Likewise, if a squirrel runs through that clearing, or a rabbit, or a skunk, or a mail carrier, a creature of any kind, a dog is going to chase it, regardless of whether it is worth chasing or not. Now think of a lion sitting in a clearing. A lion calculates carefully, is this worth reacting to or not? A lion might chase a zebra. It's not going to chase a squirrel. It's certainly not going to chase a stick. We can choose what's worth spending our energy on. There are lots of provocations, and some demand a fierce response. Some are just irritating. So we can decide calmly and not reactively how to respond to what 
walks past us in life. Next, Jesus tells his disciples, stay in the same house when they find a welcoming place. Don't move from one house to another. So this is a reminder about blooming where we're planted, I think. Whenever we're in unfamiliar territory, and this is true in our personal lives too, whenever we start a new job or move to a new house or a new city or begin a new stage of life, there's always that, that in-between time when it feels uncomfortable and we think, this is it, okay, this is not the right choice, I have to move on. There's always jokes about moving to Canada in times like this, socially, when our country seems so inhospitable. But that feeling passes. And sometimes the key is putting down roots where we are and just knowing and believing that things will get better. There will come a time when we're going to thrive again. I think of a tree that I once saw, a fully grown tree with roots and a trunk that was growing out of the side of a cliff, first like this, then like this was growing at an angle from this, this tiny shelf of rock where just the smallest wisp of soil must have landed and, and a seed fell there. So this tree was growing upward, defying gravity, defying every downward pull, just reaching for the sun's light. And it reminded me that life is incredibly resilient, and so are we. We can thrive in very unpromising places. Next, Jesus says, when people react to you, when they reject you, shake the dust off your feet. So this is an ancient expression. It symbolizes rejection. So he's telling us here, reject the rejection. When you meet opposition, don't take it in. Don't let it weaken you. You might have heard of Olympia Brown. She was a suffragist. She was also ordained by the Universalist Church of America in 1863. She's the first woman to be ordained and have that ordination recognized by a denomination in the United States. But of course, she had to fight to get there. When she applied to seminaries, several rejected her right off the bat. At last, she applied to the theological school at St. Lawrence University up in the North Country. And the dean wrote her a reply in which he told her three things. He told her in no uncertain terms, number one, that he did not believe women were called to ministry. Number two, that he thought she wouldn't thrive here, she wouldn't be happy. And number three, that he sternly counseled against her enrollment. Having said all this, he figured that was the end of it, that she wouldn't come. But on the first day of classes, there she was, seated at her desk in the ministry classroom, the only woman, that, the only woman there. And the dean just about fainted from surprise, but after all, he had not expressly forbidden her enrollment. So why wouldn't she come? Olympia Brown said, his discouragement was my encouragement. She rejected his rejection. Jesus tells us not to let the naysayers get us down, to just keep showing up, and as Gandhi says, be the change we wish to see. Next, Jesus gives some hopeful words. He says, behold, I've given you the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. So what would you or I do if we saw it? snake or a scorpion in front of us on the sidewalk. We'd probably go around it, right? Maybe widely around it. We all would. This is the natural reaction. Avoid that which might cause us pain. But Jesus believes this is no kind of way to live. With anything scary or painful, actually going around it doesn't work. Avoidance isn't the answer. So when we're grieving a loss or facing an obstacle of some kind or confronting a fear, the way out is through. Jesus promises to give us everything we need to face the things that might sting us or threaten us in life. We can walk right up to meet them. With his spirit, we're enough. Finally, when the disciples return joyful, having done what Jesus asked, having cast out forces that harm people, he applauds them, he gives thanks, but then he adds, don't rejoice because the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. We can't be too attached to outcomes, to success or failure. We're peacemakers and neighbors and prophets and healers, not because we're hoping for some immediate reward, but because this is what God calls us to be. To be the hands and feet of Christ, to fill the world with his spirit, to be humble and mindful and resilient and brave, 
These things are their own reward. So this is the final takeaway for us today, and hopefully it's one we can carry with us. Jack Kerouac said, practice kindness to everyone, and you will realize you are already in heaven now. Yo